While a global health crisis brings illness, death, and job loss to citizens and governments, people scramble to spread, to contain the spread of the virus. Others eye the chaos as an opportunity to plunder and profit. We can say this is a great day for organized crime and corruption. In this webinar with veteran investigative reporters, we discuss trends in crime and corruption during the COVID-19 pandemic and how journalists can hold governments, corporations, and criminals in, to account in their countries. Hello, everyone. I'm Louise Shelley, and I'm welcome to the ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum. I am the Omar L. and Nancy Hurst Endowed Chair and a university professor at George Mason University. I'm also the director and founder of the Terrorism Transnational Crime and Corruption Center. I've been invited to the forum by ICFJ to host this important discussion today that's produced in partnership with the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, also known as OCCRP, covering pandemic profiteers, trends in crime and corruption. Um, one of the things that we're seeing, or many of the things I should say we're seeing, is a broad range of impacts of the pandemic. We're seeing, and we'll talk about more today, how is the pandemic affecting pr procurement, fraud in person, on phone, online, the health impacts with counterfeit medicines and masks, environment, human exploitation, including smuggling of people, labor, and sex trafficking. And we're also going to talk a little bit on the crackdown of the media as people's focus is elsewhere on the health crisis. So there are many topics to talk about in this hour, and we hope that we will have lively discussion with all of you around the world. If you're joining us on Zoom today, please submit your questions on the Zoom chat, which you'll find in the menu options below. If you're watching from Facebook live stream, put your comments in the, below the video and they will be brought to me um, by the coordinator of this video. Today, we bring you three very talented veteran investigative reporters from around the world. And they will be telling us what they're seeing in their regions and we can discuss how those insights can help inform your discussions and what is common and what we're observing around the world. First, we have Aubrey Belford, who is a regional editor for OCCRP based in Kiev, Ukraine. And he's been leading up the coronavirus investigations for OCCRP. Generally, he conducts global stories on nexus of disinformation, crime, corruption, and has led projects including Paradise Leaves, The Theft of the Maldives, and Spooks and Spin, Information War in the Balkans, and more recently has led this project on the coronavirus. And you can check this out on OCCRP.org. Moscow-based Roman Amin, winner of the 2020 ICFJ Night Trailblazer Award is the founder of iStories, short for Important Stories, an investigative news site that digs deeply into stories that are difficult to tell in Vladimir Putin's Russia. He has worked extensively with the OCCRP network on cross-border investigations and through his work um, has exposed high-level corruption, cronyism, and money laundering. Indira Suera Acosta, a SEMBRA Media Ambassador and member of the Connectus Network, is joining us today from the Dominican Republic, where she is an investigative reporter. She currently works with Politeca Checa, the country's first major fact-checking project, and has also reported on government corruption and transparency during the pandemic. So welcome to all of you. I know you have fascinating insights to share, and I turn the floor over to you. Let's start off with Aubrey. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so, 
you know, I, I, I want to share a little bit just about what we've been doing at OCCRP. Um, for those of you that don't know, OCCRP is a network of investigative journalists spread all over the world now. Uh, and we look into to crime and corruption. So as soon as the pandemic started, um, you know, we pretty much like, you know, anyone with, with common sense realized that this is gonna be a big opportunity um, for some bad actors to try and make money out of people's uh, fear and out of the chaos and confusion. Uh, and that's what we see uh, that happened. So we did uh, a few investigations. Um, that you know looked into into various uh, aspects of it uh, partly what we're looking at is um how uh you know criminal groups or, or just corrupt politicians or individuals or unethical businesses uh tried to profit from new regulations that were brought into place or new demand or um you know uh, lack of information uh, and another thing that we looked into is how existing criminal networks and criminal enterprises responded to the pandemic. Um, so we actually did a quite a, a detailed project looking into what happened uh, with the cocaine trade uh, in response to the pandemic. Uh, you know, when the whole world went into lockdown, you know, how does cocaine move? Uh, and that was really, really fascinating. I mean, you know, spoiler alert is that in drug traffic is very good at finding their way around, um, you know, <laughs> uh you know uh, restrictions and blockages and things like that very dynamic but we got into quite a bit of detail with that uh another uh major thing that we looked at was on the questionable certification for personal protective equipment in particular respirator masks you know these uh, n95 masks or equivalent uh, that block out most viral particles uh, and what we found there is that rather than you know, purely criminal uh, groups um, being the main ones to benefit. You know, the, the big thing, the big money that we're finding is just a lot of gray area, gray business where unclear rules and um, kind of regulatory uncertainty allows for uh, a lot of uh, substandard or, or fake goods to flood the market. And if we're talking about respirators, I mean, we, we focused on, on Europe and the rules there. I mean, we found that really <laughs> the majority of, of what's been coming in and what's been sold is either fake or improperly documented. Um, you know, we, we spoke to people in the industry that were reviewing the documentation for a lot of, of stuff coming in. And, you know, in some cases we had people telling us none of what they've seen you know, that was getting procured by governments or when clients would come to them and say, hey, we're looking at buying this, can you have a look at the papers? None of it was real. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's pretty remarkable the scale of the stuff that we, we found so far. Thank you. Let's move on to Roma. Sorry. Uh, hi everybody. Uh, so I used to be with uh, Nova Gazeta, but recently we started uh, I Stories, uh, which is uh, an investigative platform for journalists in Russia. And it was actually a big challenge for us. I mean, COVID, because uh, as investigative reporters, we are used to have a lot of time to dig on stories. To uh, you know, sometimes we spend like half a year to to write a story. And during the pandemic, we realized that we have to be, that we have to investigate uh, fast. We have to investigate with the speed of news. Uh, and it was a big challenge for us. But uh, I'm happy that we uh, were able to uh, cover some of, uh, some very important stories that resulted in, that had some, some, some good impact actually. Um, so what we see in Russia and what we actually see in some other countries, uh, especially in former USSR countries, uh, is that uh, coronavirus led to huge monopoly in terms of procurement. Uh, so the states were saying that they don't have time to uh, organize bids and that is why they have to buy from a single supplier. Uh, and uh, that created huge opportunities for uh, cronies of the president, like in our case, uh, all the mechanical ventilators in Russia um during the pandemic were uh sold from a single producer who belongs to a holding uh led by vladimir putin's uh former kgb partner 
Um, what we also were able to find that those ventilators were actually technically, uh, uh, they were bad actually. They, they uh, some of them even uh, burned out and uh, killed a couple of people in hospitals, but still, you know, uh, because the state said that they don't have time to organize bids and to uh, competitive bids, uh, they were buying those ventilators sometimes through dodgy companies, through uh, intermediaries, uh, through bogus companies, which inflated prices, uh, which they then were laundered. Uh, we also focused uh, a lot on uh, how the state is uh, actually fining uh, citizens, because uh, you know that in Russia, uh, the quarantine was really strict, especially in Moscow. And uh, people got huge fines for uh, leaving their apartments. And the state decided to uh, control people to uh, download a special app on the phone, um, on their cell phones. And the problem was that uh, this app uh, was actually bad developed and uh, 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 or sometimes people who even uh, who even were not sick or who didn't leave the apartment uh, got uh, sometimes four or five fines every day. Uh, and uh, you know, since Russia is a poor country and people don't have money sometimes to you know I don't know to pay for their apartments, they didn't have money to pay fines. And the problem when the state is corrupt and when the state is uh, authoritarian. Uh, is that uh, courts don't work. Uh, so what we were able to investigate was uh, how actually courts were, uh, were uh, dealing with those uh, complaints from people. And for instance, we were able to prove that uh, one judge in the Russian region uh, um, uh, made his decision on 252 cases just during one day. So we calculated that he spent 16 seconds on every case, which means that of course they didn't uh, properly uh, they didn't properly looked into the cases into the complaints by people who were fined. Uh, so this was uh, actually a big story for us as well. And then we cooperated with OCCRP. Uh, we actually uh, used uh, most of the reporting that I've done by OCCRP in terms of uh, rapid tests. Uh, and uh, thanks to Aubrey, you know. Uh, actually, OCRP found that those tests were produced in uh, China uh, and uh, they were actually not very precise. Uh, but the Russian state is probably one of the last, uh, the Moscow government is one of the last who is still buying those tests, even despite the fact that they are not really uh, working. Um, yeah, so that's briefly uh, stories we uh, did and that's briefly what we see in terms of uh, procurement and corruption uh, during the pandemic. Thank you. Very interesting. And Adira, tell us what's going on in Santo Domingo. <laughs> well, um, basically in the Dominican Republic, we've been dealing with, besides COVID, with a really strong electoral campaign ever since last year. So we're in the middle of that situation. And that is where most of the reporting and most of the investigative journalism has been um, covering. Um, for example, these elections were the most, I could say that they were the most decisive elections in the last 16 years in the country because there's a lot in state and there's um, a, a procurement of changement and also there is a lot of um, discontent with the way that corruption works in the Dominican Republic and also with the way that the actual the current government is handling corruption so i think that that really in in a way helps a lot um investigative journalism and journalism in general and it it's even more important now that in times of the pandemic of the coronavirus pandemic so what happens in countries such as the dominican republic or haiti um, because we're next to Haiti, um, is the fact that corruption is something that it's common, sadly, in countries in Latin America. Um, we're used to bribery, we're used to um, corruption, we're used to that type of 
practices and wrongdoing. Um, so a lot of investigative journalism have been covering all of those issues from a long time ago. Um, I consider also that there's a lot of um, examples of corruption and how it affects um, the pandemic right now with the COVID-19 and with the access to healthcare and the access to health uh, systems. And for example, in the Dominican Republic, we see that the government only dedicates 1.8% of its entire budget to um, health. Um, and we are one of the lowest, con uh, one of the countries with lo the lowest um, scores in production of um, budget for the health system. So what we're watching now and what we're um, witnessing right now is the result of years of corruption and years of um, a lot of silence from the government and not applying um, the right uh, punishment to those people that are corrupt. Um, so in countries like Cuba, Costa Rica, where you have the most um, budget for health systems, you see that it's different. So I think that it's, uh, at least in Latin America, I can say that it's a very important position for investigative journalism. And it's uh, an extremely important and decisive moment to write articles about um, exposing corruption because we have a lot of corruption and we're used to it. And what is the response to these write-ups that you're having of corruption in DERA? Uh, well, basically since we're in the middle of the change uh, of a governmental change, because for example, right now in this weekend, actually on Sunday, we're having a new president. So we're in the middle, not only of the a sort of a lack of response from the government from for the the COVID crisis, because the government, the current government, is in the middle of a changement. Um, we're we're witnessing the the um, the opposition come into power, and that is a very crucial and very um, important change. So we are basically in the middle of two waters. In one side, you have the pandemic, the coronavirus virus pandemic and everything that comes with that. And in the other hand, you have the, the elections and the result of the electoral campaign that lasted more than a year. And also, I don't know if, um, so I will say it because I imagine that there are a lot of people from different parts of the world. Only in this year, we had two elections. One in February, that was the municipal elections. And the other one, um, a couple of months ago, and those were the presidential elections, but we also had two suspended elections because in the first elections in February, there were, it was the first time actually that the elections were suspended in the, Demo in the democratic history of the Dominican Republic. And that was because of failures, according to what the officer said, it was because of failures with the electronic voting system. Um, and now the other uh, election that was suspended was because of the COVID. So we're in during all of those times and in all of those moments, there was money spent for uh, camp uh, electoral campaigning. Um, and with that comes also a lot of corruption and crime. Um, this part, the, in this time from the government and from the, uh, political candidates. Thank you. Aubrey, in OCCLP has done other work on what is going on with the environment, with forests, with human smuggling. Uh, can you say a little bit more about some of these other problems that are going on under COVID that are not getting as much attention as they should? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a perfect time to, to hide what you're doing. Um, okay. I, it really depends on the type of crime as to, you know, whether or not coronavirus has had a, a big impact. Um, I haven't looked in into human smuggling or anything like that. You know, we did focus on, on, on drug smuggling. Um, I would guess that, that most probably there's not so much uh, human smuggling just because there's not so much movement of people. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't actually know, to be honest, because I haven't looked into it. Um, 
In terms of environmental effects, again, we haven't looked into it. We've mostly been looking into, into health effects of corruption um, in, in the time of the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, Roman mentioned a little earlier about the investigation that we did together into rapid tests. So, I mean, I'll explain that one a little bit. We're basically that, you know, when the pandemic started, there was huge demand for testing. And one of the types of tests that, that people were, you know, scrambling over each other to buy were rapid antibody tests, where you do a little finger prick and you get some blood and then you test for antibodies. Uh, and you get the results very quickly, you know, on a little cassette or a stick or something like that. So a lot of people started rushing to buy these because they thought, you know, this could show whether or not you're infected. Uh, but in actual fact, they don't. They just show, you know, whether you've got an antibody response. And um, typically they don't even really quite accurately show this until uh, some weeks. So, you know, they're not uh, useful as a diagnostic tool. Uh, what we found also was that uh, one of the major Chinese brands that had been um, already independently tested and found not to be terribly accurate um, was being sold under American or European brand names as if it was made in the USA or if it was made in the Netherlands, when in fact it was made in China and repackaged. Um, and this is actually another example of gray area um, stuff when you can actually do that, which is really surprising, but you can actually get, you know, some kinds of, of medical equipment like a test and repackage it, put your own name on it and say it's made in, in the Netherlands. And so with this, we, we tracked it uh, around the world. We tracked it to Indonesia where, um, you know, the state pharmaceutical company bought 300,000 um, copies of it. Uh, and they're still using rapid tests um, you know, to say if people are allowed to travel and things like that. We, we tracked it to Russia where the Moscow city government was buying it. We tracked it to places like Macedonia where we actually found that false negatives from the tests, um, you know, were linked to some, potentially some deaths and also to an outbreak um, amongst guests on a political TV show that basically led like a big chunk of the country's political elite uh, to go into self-isolation. Um, so that, that was kind of where we ended up going with the effects of, of these um, kind of corruption scandals. All right. Roman, can you say a little bit more when you talked earlier about the difficulties of changing your way of doing investigative journalism, especially in an environment like Moscow where it's been so difficult to go outside? Can you give some tips to other journalists on how to do this and how to change your techniques? Uh, right, so one of the main difficulties for me is that I'm kind of, uh, you know, there are two types of reporters uh, today. Those who uh, do, the, uh, those who spend the majority of their time investigating what is in online databases. Uh, and uh, the old style of reporting, you know, is when you meet sources and I love to kind of mix uh, both approaches. So I love to meet people and talk to them to meet sources and so on. And during the pandemic, I couldn't meet people. So uh, I had to concentrate only on my uh, online part of uh, research. Uh, and uh, what it, but what is important is that, you know, with my sources, I kind of developed uh, the strategy of secure communication. And that's what we uh, try to uh, develop and promote, uh, not only in Russia, but, you know, on all these uh, conferences when we talk about security and uh, secure communication. And the pandemic showed how important it is to actually know the tools and use them because uh, this is the time when you uh, spend a lot of time communicating with your sources uh, via online tools. Did you, uh, um, sorry, did you find it, I guess, in India as well, that like when everyone was home, it was actually easier to make some new sources or that people were a bit more willing to talk? Uh, no, I don't think so, because, uh, well, in Russia, everybody's paranoid and uh, people don't really like to discuss sensitive stuff via phone, uh, even if it's uh, done in encrypted chats, right? Uh, but yeah, people had to uh, 
had to talk more uh, on the phone. But it wasn't easier, uh, at least for me and for people I talked to. Uh, that was one of the challenges. And another challenge was, of course, that you, since everybody, everything was changing so fast, you had to investigate fast. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, the story which we did on mechanical ventilators, it was a, actually a great story because it had its impact, you know, and uh, in a couple of weeks after we published a story where we said that these ventilators are actually bad and they're sold through bogus companies, uh, they burned in two hospitals and I think six people died. And uh, the government actually blocked, uh, blocked the contract. So those ventilators were not uh, sold anymore. I, I don't know about uh, the current, uh, uh, what's going on now, but yeah, so the story had a deep impact and we had only one week to investigate it, which was, you know, uh, which was a short period of time. Um, so I think, yeah, this were the main challenges we faced. I, I about, agree um, with that. This, sorry. Oh, sorry, Aubrey. No, I was thinking about what Roman was saying um, on terms of the length that you have to do investigations and the length of investigations and the time that you have to investigate, um, usually in investigative journalism and in journalism in general, you take uh, more time to investigate and to do um, data research and fact check and everything. So um, now with the pandemic and with the current way of doing investigations that is basically from your house or not going out as much, um, everything has to be even faster than it used to be before. So I think that that is also a change that I've seen um, reflected in the way that we report, at least here in the Dominican Republic. Yeah, I found that, um, you know, the investigations that we do, we tend to have reporting teams that are scattered all over the world in different time zones and whatever. So, you know, a lot of the communication will happen on, um, well, I mean, all of the communication will happen on, on online platforms, you know, through encrypted um, chats or, you know, you set up wikis and things like that to share notes or secure areas. And I found that um, since the start of quarantine, uh, people got better at that. Um, I guess because they're at home more and because there was this more rushed time scale, that actually it, it kind of, we made a little leap in just people's ability to stay in touch and to stay on, stay on the same page, uh, contribute to discussions and things like that. Um, yeah, I don't know if other people found that with their teams as well. And it seems to be that the habit has stuck since then, even as things have eased up a little bit, people are still a little bit better. But I'm wondering if you guys had similar experiences with people you worked with, did they get better at this or not? Well, I work by myself most of the time. So, uh, <laughs> um, but I can speak for myself, but um, I think that reporting has, it necessarily has to become better. It necessarily has to improve, especially in times of crisis. Um, and I think that fr from times of crisis is where, when you have um, mo the most oppor opportunities to um, grow and to make a better um, reporting. Um, and also, for example, I work alone, but this pandemic also has shown me that it's extremely important to collaborate. Um, I imagine that you all uh, work in networks and all of that, but I think that at least in my case, and I think that it's um, something that it's really common among investigative journalism, uh, journalists that they work by themselves. Um, so I think that this time and this pandemic has um, remarked for me the importance of collaboration when doing investigative journalism. It's, um, it's necessary, at least for me. Can I ask you two questions, Indira? Because I've seen you nodding your head when I was talking about the impact. One was on migration issues because the Dominican Republic has for a long time been a key hub of human smuggling. And what is happening now, as the comment was made, that people are moving less or there are people stuck from other parts of the world in the Dominican Republic. And also on the environmental issue, which you've talked to me about before this as a problem. If you could say a little bit on your investigations on these areas. Um, well, basically regarding um, human trafficking and human smuggling, I will say that we, for example, have a lot of 
trafficking from Haiti to here because um, we basically share borders. And, um, but it's also because of the corruption, like uh, in the border, you can come and enter easily. It's not, um, there's not a lot of enforcement in the border from both sides of, of the island. Um, so what we've seen is a lot of Haitians returning to their houses um, in Haiti. And that has brought up even more problems in that country because there's no regulations on health, um, security, um, testings or things like that. Um, I haven't seen, um, I was doing some investigations about human um, trafficking, but I, do, I haven't um, checked at any articles published during the pandemic. What I did so uh, what I did see was um, that a, some uh, a group of organizations were asking for to for people to remember that human trafficking trafficking is still there, um, and that it's a very crucial and very important point to treat in the Dominican Republic. Um, also, the United States lowered the qualification of the Dominican Republic. That happened just uh, a few. Um, a few weeks ago, it lowered the qualification of the Dominican Republic in terms of how the government is handling the human trafficking. Um, and that happened in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and regarding the environment, uh, we've been affected, I will say, for two, um, basically in two um, ways. One was with the Duquesa fire. Duquesa is an open air landfill that has been very criticized because of the way that um, everything is handled there, because of the way that, uh, because of the fact that it's an open air landfill that takes much of the garbage of the entire capital and other um, cities. Um, so during the, one of the highest points in the pandemic, that landfill um, was burned and so far, we don't know who burned the landfill. Um, and that caused a tremendous uh, impact on health and on, because we were already affected by the pandemic, um, but we were also affected by the smokes that came out of the landfill. That was one, uh, one example. Um, and another one that I was thinking about is that recently, for example, we had the inauguration of the Punta Catalina plant and that those are coal-based plants, um, elect electric plants, um, and they were financed with money from Odebrecht. And Odebrecht it was um, a tremendous, um, a really big company that was bribing, let's put it like that, different countries in Latin America, 12 countries actually, giving money um, to those countries. So we had the inauguration of those, uh, of the power plant and we've been having a couple of weeks with a lot of smoke coming out of those plants. Um, so all of the 10,000 um, families that live near the plant had been affected by that as well. Just to comment, the Odebrecht is a, a, a political scandal that started in Brazil. Yeah. And Odebrecht is a Brazilian company that's been in operation in so many countries. Yeah. And there, right. Sorry, Luis, yeah. they were based here in the Dominican Republic. Their, their operations were from the Dominican Republic to other places. Oh. Yeah, and so far, none, uh, no one has been judged uh, because of it, unlike other countries in which presidents and um, other politicals and, and, and people from business area had been judged. So, yeah. Thank you. Interesting. <laughs> All of a sudden, we have a lot of questions now, so I'm glad the ice has been broken. So first question is, how do you get your leads during the pandemic working from home? Can all of you answer this briefly? I've got a lot now, so. Um, I, I would say that uh, for, for us as a big network, basically, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways that it happens. Um, you know, it comes from um partly just so, like pre-existing sources that you have a good relationship they'll they'll tip off one of our reporters the other thing is just um looking at 
the, the new regulatory environment and business opportunities and just trying to think like a crook. Um, you know, the thing is with this is because it's a new situation and because everyone's rushing, it's often not terribly sophisticated and not that hard to find. So if you're just sort of thinking about, well, okay, if I was trying to rip it off, what would I do? And you just do a little bit of online searching, you can find some pretty interesting leads straight away. You know, substandard products being offered by unclear people or whatever. Um, and so, you know, with us, with the big network, it's like with those two approaches, we would get something. So for example, with rapid tests, this came from Macedonia where there was already a little bit of a, a mini scandal around one of the private hospitals offering rapid tests and, you know, then someone died and it was a little bit of a thing, but no one actually knew why or what was wrong. But when we started looking into that and then looking into that company and the documentation and tracing it back, looking at the regulations, we realized, oh, actually this is a broader issue here. Then we brought in other partners and, you know, we found it was manufactured in the Netherlands. So we talked to Dutch partners and the Dutch partner was Googling around and said, hey, I found the clinical study for this test. It's identical for a Chinese one. And, you know, and so it just snowballs from there. So there's no hard and fast rule, but I'd say that like, if, you, if you're working with a large number of people, then with people with different experiences and different sources can turn something very small into something big. And that works really well in this kind of environment. Hey, Roman, when you address this on how you find your, your, your stories, could you also say, how did you find out the names of suppliers of rapid tests and other medical equipment? Did you need an insider source or you found this out through documents online? Yeah, I mean, the procurement database in Russia is open uh, and we, uh, you know, it wasn't difficult for us to find the latest news stories during the pandemic because we constantly, uh, we constantly search things in these databases, we constantly monitor them. And since recently, actually, we started using uh, so, uh, some um, programmatic techniques to parse them. So, for instance, uh, you know, if uh, a couple of years ago I had to manually uh, search for contracts and analyze the suppliers and so on and so forth, uh, you know, I spent like the last year and a half uh, learning coding and now everything is done automatically, you know. I don't even spend time on it because I get the newsletter with the biggest contracts and with uh, some analysis of the uh suppliers uh and i don't spend time on it so in that investing your time in learning how to code uh and learning you know online technology is really uh key to uh being a reporter a successful reporter today and dara do you want to continue with that um well what i've been doing is that i've been working a lot with experts um, and that has proven to be really helpful for me because I get a lot of insight for stories from their perspective. Um, and that has helped me to have a lot of good stories and also to have um, condensed stories and stories full of, pur of purpose. Um, and I was uh, listening to what Roman was saying about the importance of knowing how to use technology in our advantage. And I think that that is also uh, is something, is something that I don't necessarily, necessarily use as much, but that I think that is way too important. And that um, specifically now uh, from everything that I've learned during this months of pandemic and crisis, um, I think that it's very good to have a automatic Automatic, automatized, sorry, um, system that helps you to do your investigations and that makes your life a little bit easier, I will say. Next question for all of you. Are you aware of any effective counter corruption efforts against this COVID corruption? Or is this just an unrestricted feeding frenzy at the moment? Can you, I have a bunch of messages. Everybody's now ready to talk. So be, so um, try and t tell us what's going on in this area. It's a fading frenzy. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know. I can't, I can't really think of any 
huge uh, successes off the top of my head. So, Indira? Um, well, I agree with Aubrey. Um, at least here in the Dominican Republic, I see, I could say that people are more aware. Um, public opinion is more aware of what is happening. And I see sort of a, an awakening um, of people and they're more into news, they're more into investigation. Um, and I think that that has a lot to do with the electoral campaigning and the changement of government. Uh, we are a little bit more aware of what is happening, um, but as real and effective um, solutions to the corruption, I haven't seen as many. Some really small cases, but not as many as we, all of the journalists here in the Dominican Republic would like. So we have a question here on how much is organized crime involved in this activity? Are they traditional organized crime groups as one um, panelist is asking about from Italy? Or are you seeing a more diverse range of actors involved in this? And how much of it is corruption of government actors? I'd say it's a little bit of everything. I mean, organized crime groups are definitely benefiting and we've found in our investigations um, that, you know, yeah, people with organized crime ties or members of organized crime groups will get in on, you know, a procurement contract or whatever. But I mean, you know, that's the nature of feeding frenzy is like everyone's in on it. So, I mean, yeah, you've got corrupt government officials, you've got organized crime groups, you have um, you know, companies with a history of unethical practices, or you'll just have someone who's come from nowhere and, you know, has an angle on it, um, you know. And, uh, you know, sometimes what you also have is, for example, with like masks getting imported, that people actually come into it with um, the best of intentions and say, well, you know, I know this factory in China um, and, you know, I can help out with this crisis and, you know, also make some money on the way, but because they don't know the regulatory environment and because there's other points along the way with certification, whatever, what, what ends up happening is, you know, a whole bunch of money gets spent on something useless. And it doesn't mean that everyone necessarily went in there trying to be complete crooks, but uh, because it's such a wild west kind of atmosphere, but you know, that's what happens. Roman, can you comment on this? Of who are the elements of this? Uh, yeah, I agree with Aubrey that it's kind of both. Uh, well, I mean, in general in Russia, you know, the, the current elite is the mixture of organized crime and, uh, and officials. And, uh, you know, they benefit from everything, from, uh, from oil, from gas, from uh, forests. And uh, of course, they benefit from selling uh, goods during the pandemic such as masks, uh, ventilators, uh, tests, and uh, so on. No exceptions here. Indira? Um, I was thinking about what, what Aubrey was saying. Um, it's sort of a wild, wild west uh, environment in which um, from companies to private institutions or the government is, are all mixed. Um, contributing in a certain way with corruption. Um, something also that I was thinking about is um, the presence of um, China in all of this, uh, in most of the countries in, the, in Latin America and the Caribbean and a lot of purchases that are being done um, to China. And with that also comes um, soft corruption and uh, propaganda for, from China. So I think that that is also something that it's um, very important to look at and that I think that all investigative journalism ha journalists have, have to look um, because it's, it's there and it's present. I think it's not only in the Caribbean and Latin America. I don't know if any of the rest of you, Aubrey or Roman, want to say something on this. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a significant factor pretty much everywhere, I'd say. One thing that 
all of you have not talked about, which is something that is very pronounced in the United States at the present time, is the increase in, in fraud and scams, particularly against elderly people. Many of them who are at home, who are confined, who are being reached by telephone. And have you seen this in your reporting? Do you think it's a problem that you need to report on in your regions? And many of the scammers are operating from outside the United States. So it is part of a global phenomenon, but I didn't know whether you think this is something that journalists should be looking at. It wasn't a problem. I haven't heard of uh, anything like that in Russia. The main problem with old people was that, uh, you know, since not all of them are, were, are technically good and uh, they were not able to uh, install special apps on their phones and even because, you know, in Russia, in, in Moscow, you had to sell, send selfies uh, from your apartment every half an hour to prove that you are actually staying inside of your apartment and not, you know, not all people are technically good in understanding, you know, uh, the rules and uh, what they had to do. So they were fined. And uh, even when those fines were not fair, when people didn't leave their apartments, they couldn't uh, complain because courts just didn't read, you know, what was in the complaints. and ruled in favor of the state. Mm. Indira, have you seen anything on increased fraud against individual citizens? Um, I wouldn't say, well, yes, I've seen some cases and I've uh, wrote some stories about it. Um, I've seen some cases of online fraud. Um, there had been numerous reports on um, scams and fake news as well relating to, relating to um, money and things like that. Um, and I think that it's extremely important to, look, to take a look at that um, because with all of the disorganization and all of the confusion that we, that is uh, because of the pandemic and um, in, in each of our countries, I think that that sort of um, cases will continue to, to grow up, um, at least in countries in which it's harder, it's, it's even harder to uh, pursue those scams or those probes. So I think that, yes, it's important to take a look at it. We had a comment online from someone in the webinar that um, there's certainly a problem in the UK with this. Um, we have a question on open procurement platforms. And Roman talked about how useful they were for your investigations. Aubrey, have some of the members of your team been using these and how available are they? Yeah, so actually one part of our coverage is what we did is we set up a, a cooperative a group uh, basically for all of Europe um, looking into procurement. And so we'd be able to compare the prices being paid and different trends. So pretty much every European country, you've got people into like search for COVID related procurement data and, and upload it. Um, and there's very wildly differing uh, access to information across Europe. So you've got some countries that have uh, open procurement platforms that are online um, where there's a lot of information. And in other places um, at the start of the crisis, they suspended uh, normal uh, procurement rules, uh, you know, uh, so there's no open tenders anymore, uh, and also um, curtailed uh, freedom of information. Um, so with the combination of that, you know, we, we've ended up, say just for example, across Europe with huge discrepancies between places where you can get the information you need on demand online uh, and places where, you know, even the old uh, you know, transparency rules um, just don't apply anymore. And one of the kind of strange things we noticed was that a lot of the countries that we typically think of as like the good ones, you know, countries that are well established, um, you know, liberal democracies with 
you know, supposedly a, a long history of transparency, you know, Northern European countries, Scandinavian countries, uh, these kind of countries, they actually in uh, COVID times uh, have become some of the most difficult, like true black holes mm -hmm. data. Whereas countries, um, you know, former Eastern Bloc countries uh, where there's been, you know, a lot of uh, pressure from foreign governments and donors to, to bring in systems of, of greater transparency, you know, online registries, online procurement databases, all this kind of stuff. Um, that's actually where we've been uh, more successful in getting some of the information. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's all over the place, but obviously, you know, places where you've got this stuff online, it's way better, but we've been using every tool, you know, we've been using online procurement databases where it's available. We've been using freedom of information requests. Um, we've also, you know, just been using our network of reporters to uh, hit up uh, their human sources and try and get documents leaked. Uh, so, you know, all of the above. Dara, do you have anything to add on procurement registries? Um, well, actually here in the Dominican Republic, and I will say in the Caribbean, it's kind of hard to get um, information. And we've been having some issues regarding that. Um, it's extremely difficult to get statistics or updated information because not all of the governmental institutions have um, that available on their websites. Um, so during times of pandemic, that increases even more. Um, and it's even harder to get information and to, um, to get the updated information and to get open information just from your house. Um, so I've seen a lot of complaints from journalists um, regarding that. Um, and also with transparency of information that that is also an issue that is affecting us. Okay. There's a question from the audience on how much you see this corruption affecting COVID data. And also there's a question on how much police brutality is increasing as a result of COVID. So if you could address both of these, that would be great. Do you want to start, Aubrey, with reporting on the data on COVID? Um, so, I mean, it's kind of a hard one to answer if the corruption itself is influencing data. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Um, you know, yeah, I'd actually say that, yeah, I mean, as I was saying before, that the situation kind of leading up to now countries with um, serious corruption problems where there's been a lot of uh, pressure from uh, civil society or from outside donors and outside governments to bring in transparency measures to combat uh, corruption, you know, ends up that we actually have some pretty good data. Um, and then, you know, we end up in like pretty kind of good reporting kind of environment where you're in a country where there's still a lot of corruption, but there's also a lot of access to records. Um, if the question is asking in terms of like the count of, of cases and infection rates and things like that, and I don't know if that's a result of corruption. I think if you, you're talking about, um, you know, the number of cases, hospitalizations, deaths, things like that, you know, the count uh, of those numbers would be down to two factors. One is state capacity. You know, obviously richer, more developed countries are, are better at counting this. They are able to have, you know, more comprehensive testing regimes. Um, and the second thing is, you know, the will of, of a country's leadership. Um, you know, when you, you just don't, when you have denialists in power, um, you know, they don't do a very good job of counting it. And, you know, everyone knows exactly kind of uh, countries I'm talking about. Um, but corruption per se, influencing that, I, I wouldn't say I've seen a direct link. Roman and Indira, can you? Oh, um, and also answer the question not only about data, but also about police brutality. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I think, you know, Roman's story in Russia is, is kind of related to that. Our uh, partners in Serbia also uh, documented some, you know, cases of real excessive, um, you know, state uh, violence or just 
kind of punitive actions against people uh, or using uh, coronavirus as a pretext um, to, to harass and intimidate people. And obviously we've seen, you know, some pretty egregious examples of this in other places like Hungary, uh, where, you know, Viktor Orban um, used the, the crisis to, to, you know, grant himself the power to rule by, by decree for a time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a thing. Okay. Oh, India. India is a classic example of this. I mean, ridiculous cases of violence against um, people for violating uh, lockdown rules, including torturing people to death. Roman? Uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of data, you know, during the pandemic, we had a very important, uh, it wasn't actually an election, it was voting. Uh, it was uh, voting for a constitutional change that allow that would allow Vladimir Putin to stay in power for the next 12 years. So, uh, and, uh, you know, we published some stories and not only us, but many other media, we have, you know, we were able to prove that those, uh, that the voting was actually faked and uh, uh, that about 20 million of votes were uh, actually faked. And the reason I mentioned it uh, was uh, that because, uh, you know, when they realized, when they announced that they gonna, uh, they're gonna help this uh, voting, uh, all of a sudden, uh, the data about uh, the number of dead and infected has changed. Uh, so the numbers went down dramatically. And the state was kind of claiming that you see, you know, we are very good in, uh, uh, in fighting coronavirus and uh, we are controlling everything. And uh, so let's organize voting because it's, uh, it's not dangerous anymore. And you need to understand that voting means millions of people uh, without any social distance, they go to the polls, they vote and so on. Uh, we also actually, we investigated this story and we uh, were able to prove that the state spent hundreds of millions of rubles on buying masks and uh, uh, antibacterial gels uh, while doctors uh, were complaining about the deficit of the very same uh, equipment, you know, so the state spent money on voting rather than doctors and uh, and and, uh, and hospitals. Uh, so we don't believe the official data about, uh, you know, even mathematicians they actually took the numbers and the state said that the distribution which the state shows in terms of impact it is actually impossible. Because uh, the numbers are out, uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, as for violence, I wouldn't uh, say that the violence from police uh, has increased, but definitely uh, the state uh, used uh, uh, used the pandemic as the pretext to uh, crack down on media. Uh, so they um, they actually sued a couple of media for fake news uh, about uh, the coronavirus. And one of the, uh, one of the worst examples is that uh, they forced Nova Gazeta, the newspaper where I used to work for 15 years, they forced to uh, uh, delete a couple of articles which, uh, which were true actually. And the articles showed how doctors in the Chechen Republic, and you know that the Chechen Republic is led by Ramzan Kandirov, one of the uh, I don't know, one of the uh, most notorious abuses of human rights in the world, uh, so that the doctors uh, experience deficit of uh, masks and, uh, and uh, other equipment. Uh, but Chechen authorities, you know, without even, courts even didn't consider these claims. They said that it's fake and the newspaper had to remove the, the articles. And the same happened in the regions. Uh, not only with the newspapers, but with the individual reporters as well. Some of the reporters were fined uh, and the state is doing everything to shut down those critical voices, you know, who criticize uh, and not only, uh, well, say the corruption, you know, during the pandemic and who criticize uh, the ways the state is uh, fighting uh, the pandemic. Before we, we go for, to Indira, there was a comment from Guatemala 
with somebody saying that um, that the Guatemalan people government has said this is a disease of the people and and their political decisions not to intervene much in Latin America. Um, Indira, can you comment on the, the statistics and data and when we talked earlier on how different the situation is between the Dominican Republic and Haiti next door? Um, well, actually in the Dominican Republic every day, and I imagine that right now, um, the Minister uh, uh, of Health is um, showing the, that the data from the day before. Um, so that has been happening ever since we began with the state of emergency. Um, and I think that is a good thing because um, it's a way to inform people about the data on the COVID, um, but also it's a way to show transparency in sort of a way. Um, of course, that we need to take in account that the data and the statistics provided may not be um, the absolute truth because also the Ministry of Health and the health system in general has um, have a lot of issues um, in regards to taking samples and to providing tests to the population. Um, but I see that that is a good approach to show um, the, the statistics every single day since, um, except from Sundays, um, since the pandemic started. Um, and regarding to the police, um, I will say that, oh, and before I go to the police, in Haiti, for example, um, even though we have, as of today, we in the Dominican Republic have the highest amount of cases in the Caribbean, um, Haiti, um, I think I have it around here. Um, in Haiti, for example, in the Dominican Republic, you have more than eight, 80,000 cases, confirmed cases. Um, and in Haiti, so far, um, we only have more than 7,000 cases, um, confirmed cases. Um, so that, I wouldn't say that in Haiti, the situation is as the one in the Dominican Republic, because it's a little bit less hard in, in that country. But I will say that those numbers reflect uh, a big issue with statistics. And um, I don't think that those numbers are completely accurate. Um, and in regards to the police, I will say that here in the Dominican Republic, probably because of a long story of corruption and um, authority uh, from the governments, we tend to believe that it's better to have um, someone in power that stands for its authority. Um, so what has been going on is that the policemen have been fighting a lot against a population that is uneducated and that has a lot of issues to follow rules and to follow, um, for example, the curfew. Um, from the first days of the state of emergency to the late June, um, we had more than 90,000 people arrested because they violated the, detained, sorry, because they violated the curfew. Um, so I think that that reflects a lot of what the police has been um, confronting um, during, during this past couple of months. Um, and, I, and also something that I've seen is that the population is demanding even more stronger actions from the police. Um, because again, because we think that authority and authoritarianism is the best answer we've been people have have been demanding and procuring more um control from the policemen thank you i've gotten since the audience has warmed up i've gotten more questions and so we're authorized to go on a few more minutes so we can run to 11 15 so if you have more questions feel free to ask them we've been having a few very interesting interjections on the Zoom webinar chat from colleagues in South Asia. Uh, and I hope 
that these will be collected in some way and made available for those of you who are following on Facebook. We have uh, a colleague from, from Bangladesh who is talking about the very serious problems of corruption, of movement mo of money out of the country, of repression that is going on against Rohingya and others, while um, people are focused much more on, on COVID. And, um, and then we have somebody from India talking about the very serious environmental issues that are going on in um, and threats to forests from coal plants, just as Indira brought up about the problems of coal plants in the Dominican Republic. So there are a lot of very good links that have been provided and I hope that they are, are shared. But overall, we've been talking in, in these web chats about problems that people believe should be investigated more is what is happening to people on the margins of society who don't have access to treatment, don't have access to livelihoods, the capital flight, problems of money laundering, um, and the emphasis that needs to be brought by the international journalistic community when there's not so much coverage inside. Um, and also the point has been made that the fact that a lot of, in some countries where journalism is, and the media is government funded, many important stories are, are not being reported. And I think that this is, you know, this is true in, in South Asia has been pointed out. It's been, uh, it's a problem elsewhere. And I think it points to the enormous need for um, greater investigation and having some of you who are able to function in different environments, helping colleagues in environments that are even harder for them. Maybe you'll comment a little on this because several of you, uh, Aubrey and Roman are part of international networks. I mean, I, I, I can just, <laughs> I can't think of any other way to be working right now than in a network, you know, with other journalists. It's, um, it's just the best. I mean, particularly when we're dealing with the global crisis, the global story and, uh, you know, global uh, trade in, in all of these really essential um, goods for dealing with pandemic, uh, you know, I mean, I would find it extremely hard to come up with any stories on my own um, without having, you know, a very talented network of people that are plugged in in a million different ways and have different points of view uh, on this who are, who are unable to share it. So, I mean, anyone who's watching this now, if you're thinking about whether or not you should be getting into collaborating, I mean, yes, you should do it. Robin? Yeah, I'm in the same here. The best stories I've done, you know, were in collaboration with my partners from OCCRP or other uh, medias and, uh, you know, Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, I don't know, uh, all the major cross-border investigative projects that I've uh, been involved in uh, proved that don't that you know the real power of journalism is actually not in competing but in uniting uh, our forces and the main idea of i thought is that we found it here is russia is actually built uh, around this uh, uh around this idea as well so we tried to collaborate not only with international partners but with with the regional reporters with the regional media because we understand that people in the regions uh not always have our uh you know, knowledge, they don't always have the time, they don't always have financial resources, not all of, all of them know how to code. So what we try to do, we try to uh, bring them into uh, joint uh, projects and work with them uh, closely and then publish simultaneously uh, our stories. Also, I mean, I just, you know, this is a pretty stressful time. And one of the most stressful things is when you're 
brushing on the competitive story and, you know, you're scared that someone's going to scoop you. So I can't share many details, but we're working on a very big story right now with a lot of partners. We got wind that one of the kind of important scoops that we're working on, someone else was about to get it um, and would probably be publishing it, you know, as we speak. So what we did is we called them up and we absorbed them. Um, and so now, you know, we don't have to worry about this competitor because they're part of our team. Um, so this is a really good strategy for your own well-being. Just absorb the competition. You know, think you're like you're like uh, Facebook with Instagram and WhatsApp and whatever. Just you know, if you can't beat them, buy them out. All right, I have. One of the things that strikes me after sharing this is that there are questions and there are people who, who want to be involved and want to have questions answered or want to be establishing communications and working with these qualified teams. For example, I now have a question here in Liberia. The trails of paper on procurement are difficult. I've written to the country offices of the World Bank and the FTB. Can you comment on what should be done? In my spare time, apart from my academic career, I help lead an anti-corruption network of which several of you I can see are on here. And there are people in that network that can directly tell you who to go and talk to. So, I mean, Stella, feel free to share my email if somebody wants to follow up with me because we have 600 people in that network and, met, and several of them could probably answer that that question. And I think that's what we see that we're needing now is how do we expand our networks internationally because something that seems to be regional to us is turn, turns out to be much broader just as you're talking as Indira talked about Odebrecht and how people think of that as a Brazilian problem but as it expanded and I've known the several of the wonderful investigators connected with that it's affected so many countries in particularly in the Western Hemisphere, but even farther than that. And Dara, did you want to say something on the comments on when you talked about being a, a lone journalist, but on the role of working with others? Um, yes, actually, um, I think that is way too important to collaborate. And during the pandemic, uh, for example, in Politica Chequea, we had the opportunity, since we do a lot of fact checking as well, we had the opportunity to come together with a network of journalists in Latin America called Latam Chequea. And most of the content and stories that we had during, uh, that we've been having during this time has come from that um, collaboration and has come from being in that organization as well. Um, and also something that happens with a lot of countries in the Caribbean, um, is the fact that we isolate um, pretty often because, uh, because of the territory, because of the characteristics of being in an, in an island. Uh, and I think that it's extremely important to open um, our minds and to open our work to other countries. Because as you mentioned, Louise, um, there are issues that we may think that only happen in our country, but that those issues also happen in other countries. Um, and a clear example also from of that and isolation is what happens in the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Uh, I was writing an article a couple of days ago about journalism during the pandemic. And I just realized that I didn't know anyone from Haiti, any journalist from Haiti. So to that point comes isolation, even in an island that is shared by two countries. Thank you. So I'm afraid which our time is at an end, though there's so much more that our panelists can say and so much more that our wonderful audience can say. So I want to thank you all for joining us and I hope you've learned something useful to inspire you and help you with your reporting in the future. And for those who are thinking about what issues you should be covering, I think we've given you a a broad range of problems which can be investigated, dealing with data, procurement, fraud, health impacts, environment, human exploitation, crackdowns, money laundering, international financial flows. All of these 
are stories worth investigating and following. If you're not a member of the ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reforming, Reporting Forum yet, please find the group on Facebook or go to the website at www.icfj.org. And don't forget to fill out the survey that'll be coming after the webinar. So thank you all for your great participation. And it was a fascinating morning for me. And I hope it was a fascinating afternoon and evening for the rest of our listeners around the world. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye. Thank you.